the experiment that was just released this last month, uh, as I said, demonstrated that people could transfer knowledge from one human to another. And I, I commented to uh, a couple of my colleagues and I said, I think right now the most direct application of that is going to be either covert communication or running drones. The set of experiments, I didn't have videos to show you, um, but there have been a series that have shown you can connect the human brain to a rat and control its motor movement and its tail. So you can have non-human animal drones. You can have the human brain probably run a regular drone at this point, but uh, running a non-human drone, something like a cockroach or a rat, would it be awesome? And now the, if you were watching the Olympics and you see the coordinated maze of drones, the software is now really readily available where you could, uh, you could have hordes of little creatures that can gain access to facilities um, or, or move around in different places, all run by a person sitting in a booth. Um, it wouldn't be, it's no more technically challenging once you do that than figuring out the logistics of how you're gonna send your signal somewhere else in the world and how to protect that signal. But um, that's, that's now, that's not um, in the future. So as you begin to think what's in five years, the interfaces are gonna become um, more delicate more refined, and as transcranial magnetic stimulation, it's a rather crude instrument right now. It creates a field that excites just hordes of neurons. But as they, as they um, refine the technology so you can get a better point specificity to the neurons you actually want to activate, you should be able to do this without penetrating the skull. Um, either someone could wear a cap, and in fact, that's how the latest brain-to-brain -brain communication in humans was done. It was done without surgery and uh, actually signaling uh, via some stimulation to the retina and the brain decoding it. Although the person consciously didn't know what the code was, the brain did. Um, so that I would recommend people becoming aware of that uh, from the human drone technology standpoint. The second field uh, that people may or may not be aware of in uh, I always tell my students, I said I wasn't around when they developed uh, atomic weapons, but um, Dr. Ventner's work is, my, my view, the equivalent of the development of nuclear weapons when you realize uh, that he created life in a cell back in 2010. I don't know if people are familiar with his work, but this technology paired with something called CRISPR, which is like an editing software for genes, makes a number of things immediately available. What he did is he programmed yeast cells to produce anything he wanted. They can produce perfume, they can produce petroleum, they can produce any peptide, anything we program the DNA to do, and it's in the living cell. Right, so in medicine, the goal in medicine now is to be able to do uh, designer medicine and therapy. If we can design a cell to get into your body and release the right product for you, you won't be losing half the drugs you take through your liver when you swallow a pill and it gets digested. These can be inserted into you through the hypospray uh, needles, almost like Dr. McCoy on Star Trek, giving you the hyperspray. It just blasts now plasmids into your squamous cells. But uh, Ventner was able to do that and has the patent on the technology. But you can engineer anything. You can engineer a unique thing that would only kill one person in the world. It's how it's done. You put in a specific gene slicing, you program what you like, you put it in the cell, and it can reproduce and make as much as you like. For those of you who don't know, your DNA is usually all wrapped up in tight little coils. And so what you're doing is when they create plasmids and put them into cells, it sends a signal and tells which portion of the DNA should unwrap, unfold, and produce a product. Now this is the future of medicine. Uh, when you look at this technology in medicine and say, this is going to be done to help people, right? We want to be able to give them medicines. We actually want to correct for genetic deficits. If a kid's born with a genetic anomaly, with the CRISPR technology, the feeling is we can create the portion of the gene they're missing and go have it spliced back in. And that may help a child, either if it's in utero development or once they're older, to have the missing substance actively produced. What would you do with this if you were in security and intelligence? Well, you can do a number of things. You could decide if you make this gene, we know that certain people in the world who function at very high altitudes very, very well do it because they had a special mutation in their genome that we don't have because we didn't grow up in the Himalayas. But they can function at very high altitudes. Could you give this to people who are going to have to do war fighting in high altitudes and they don't require extra support? Their body makes a much more efficient use and can work under conditions of lower oxygen than the rest of us. 
you start letting your mind wander, can it also produce a substance that lets you um, function longer underwater without oxygen? So, but these are run by certain mutations in genes. And with CRISPR, we have the ability to actually make these and see what happens when we give them to animals, non-human or human animals, that don't have it naturally. You could have the Forrest Gump gene. You guys have been tracking. There's a gene that just makes you stronger. I would say that most of this technology is probably going to be employed by a state and not non-state actors because it's quite technical. But I say that with a caveat. When we study the Um Shinrikyo, um, if people remember, they had both uranium mines and regular uh, laboratories where they experimented on both uh, animals and uh, had a whole series of laboratory experiments to develop uh, the uh, different kinds of gases that they wanted. Their goal was to actually mine uranium and probably come up with their own version of a nuclear weapon. But they recruited scientists, PhD level folks, uh, and their goal was to be the rightful people running the country of Japan. But we can't assume that just because they're non-state actors, they will not um, make use of some technology around this. Related to this is an idea called dreads. These are designer receptors that can be remotely controlled. So think about it for a moment. You can create a designer receptor. You can create a cell. You can put it somewhere in the body. And you can remotely activate it when the brain's exposed to the right signal. Using this technology, people have been able to transfer memories from one fruit fly to another by signaling through a, a light stimulus uh, into the retina. Right now, in, in most animals, it's done by putting a substance into their body uh, that will actually activate the neuron in the way that you want it. So you have the capacity to create any product. As long as you know the DNA sequence, you can insert it into a living system, and you can remotely control it. So in medicine, we think about how we do that to help people, how we do to repair deficits. Other people are going to think about how do they do it to expand possibilities. Now, one of the challenges that we have is that when you create a cell and you put it in somebody's body, you have to figure out where you want it. What if you want it in their brain? Right? If you want it in their brain and you can't figure out you don't want to do surgery to plant it in their brain, if I want a product produced in your brain that may affect the way you think, the way you act, one route to that is through uh, stem cells. If you're a quick brush up on your biology, stem cells are cells, they're called God cells. They can turn into anything. They hold the potential, unlike other cells in your body, to become anything you want them to become. And they can go find their home in the body and park there and do the work that you'd like them to do. You can infuse them, and they will find their way into the brain. So once you know that the technology is there to edit, splice, and program a cell, and the technology currently exists to administer it to somebody and have it go park anywhere you program it to go park, proliferate, and do its function, you can have things activated in other people's brains. So if you take these three key points, hopefully you can see it opens up a number of both alarming and exciting possibilities.